Yeah, so my name is James Blair, and I'm here to talk about Zool, which is a project gating system that can be used with Garrett, and I think should be used with Garrett. Uh, <laughs> so just a real quick uh, little bit about Zool. Um, in case you're having trouble slotting this into uh, what particular cubby hole in your brain uh, it, it should go, we're, we're talking CI CD system here, right? But uh, I keep calling it a project gating system uh, because I think it's actually doing something a little bit different than most CI and CD systems. So I'll talk about the specifics there in a little bit. We originally developed it for the OpenStack project, um, but it has since grown uh, and is now used by quite a large number of other companies and other open source projects. Um, I helped, I started the Zool project and I help maintain it. I'm the current project lead. Uh, and I started, excuse me, started a company called Acme Gating um, where I help companies use Zool uh, and scale it more effectively. Uh, so why, why are Zool and Garrett a good match? Um, Garrett was the first of what are now four code review systems that Zool supports. Um, originally, we developed Zool, as I said, for the OpenStack project, and the OpenStack project was using Garrett. So um, that was, it was really, it was designed around Garrett. So, you know, internally, um, we, 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 have, we have objects called changes. We don't call them pull requests or, or merge requests or anything like that. We call them changes. And the GitHub driver, thank you very much, implements changes. Uh, so uh, that DNA goes all the way down to Zool's core. Um, there is no vendor lock-in. Um, in fact, quite a lot of uh, the, 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 the new hotness in CI systems are from companies that want to tie you to a specific uh, uh, code review system. And Zool really doesn't care which one you use. It's not, it's not from the Garrett project, it's not from GitHub or GitLab or anything like that. It's just an independent project that wants to be used uh, with as many of these systems as possible. Um, but since Garrett is so much better than all the other systems, and it's, yeah. It's, it's cool to be at a talk where I can say that. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll let my Garrett flag fly here. Uh, um, Zool can do some things with Garrett that really don't make sense with other systems. Uh, Garrett topics, I mean, what other system has Garrett topics? Nobody does. Um, Zool does something neat with that. We implement circular, circular dependencies with it. Um, we, we can do, and this isn't easy, but I think we can do the only workable testing you can really do with Garrett's submodule uh, subscription system. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you can make something basically testable uh, with that system. Um, and we have eight methods of interfacing with Garrett. Um, I don't know if that's something to be proud of or not, but, but we do. We have, uh, we, basically every time I come to one of these or, or meet any, with anybody in the, the Garrett um, maintainers, they, they have a new thing um, that, uh, and Luca's like, hey, we added this thing to Garrett, you should do that in Zool. And every time we do. So we've ended up with eight, eight ways of interfacing with Garrett, and I'll, I'll bore you with all eight of them uh, in a later slide. So um, uh, just to, to get this out of the way, um, on, on the other end of things, uh, so we've got Garrett and other code review systems on one side, Zool in the middle, on the other end, um, there's where Zool runs its workloads. And um, typically those are cloud VMs. The very first thing that it ever ran workloads on uh, was OpenStack virtual machines, because again, started for the OpenStack project, that's all we had. Uh, we've grown to support AWS, Google, Azure, IBM Cloud. Um, we can run workloads on Kubernetes and Open, OpenShift pods and we can run workloads on static nodes. And static nodes can be anything that you can get a shell or something like a shell on. Uh, so that could be a long running um, a physical machine, it could be a long running virtual machine, uh, it could be a car infotainment system, for example. Um, so uh, yeah, the, basically any, anything that's, that, that, that can, um, that is, addressable in some way, we can usually hook up in, into Zool and run those uh, 
run the workloads on it. Um, so why is Zool interesting? Um, it is completely Git driven. So uh, we, we're sort of Git ops people, the, the, those of us who, who started Zool. Um, we, we didn't really like the idea of going in and, and clicking things to make jobs. Um, we, we, wanted, we wanted our job definitions to go through code review. Uh, and so all of Zool's configuration, uh, there's like a small bit of configuration to bootstrap the system that you just put in a config file on disk, which you can of course also do through GitOps, right? But then once you've bootstrapped Zool, uh, it actually reads all of its configuration dynamically from Git repositories themselves. So um, in, in fact, the, the startup sequence for Zool for a completely blank new Zool is kind of insane. It, it, it checks every branch of every repo that it knows about looking for config files and, and loads it all in, into memory. Once it's there, uh, it, since it's watching the code review system continuously, any, uh, any uh, updates that it gets, uh, it, it knows about immediately. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, there's centralized and decentralized control model, mo models. Uh, so it sort of adapts to, to whatever your um, organization requires. Uh, it supports cross-project collaboration. So again, if you have uh, different parts of your organization doing different things, you can work together using Zool as an intermediary. Um, it supports something called speculative execution. Uh, where it will uh, sort of create a, a f an expected future state and it will run all of its jobs and use all its configuration with that. Uh, and it supports this idea of project gating, which I keep saying, but I haven't really told you about yet, but I will, I promise. Um, so back to, to Git driven, like I said, uh, Zool gets all of its configuration from uh, the Git repositories that it controls uh, and, and and, and some from a, a GitOps, DevOps, whatever perspective, uh, I, I think this is really neat because uh, you can commit your code and your infrastructure changes together, whether that's um, adding new jobs, uh, changing, changing jobs to, to support the new feature that you're implementing, whatever it is. Uh, all of these things can, ha can happen more or less atomically uh, and, and together, so you're not, back channeling your, your CI configuration through one system while you're doing your development uh, some other way. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of the way to think about it if you're just focused on software development. If you're also supporting running infrastructure systems as well, you can run all of that through, through, through Zool as well. Uh, as an example, um, the Zool project has an instance of Zool running to do all of its validation of its changes, right? Like it's software, we do, do development just like anybody else. Um, the systems that run that software are all described in GitOps terms, uh, Ansible playbooks, that sort of thing, uh, in Git repos. They're all managed through Zool. Whenever we make a change to those, we run Zool tests that spin up ephemeral infrastructure and, and validate that everything happens and then uh, if, if everything checks out, then it actually gets to deployed to production. So it's this real kind of Zool all the way down thing that we have going there. So really, uh, if, you're, if you think that putting things in Git repos is a good idea, um, then you might like Zool. Um, like I said, there's uh, uh, a, a control model that slides all the way from central control. So if you're, if you're in an organization that's like, we need to be absolutely sure that this licensing compliance job runs on every single change that we do. Uh, then you can define that in a central repo. You can, you can force that configuration on all your users and there's nothing that they can do to avoid running that job. On the other end of the spectrum, you can let your developers just add new jobs in their own repos whenever they want with no approval from anybody else. Um, and you have full control over how much you let that happen or not. Um, you, can, you can set that little dial anywhere in between. Uh, most people put it somewhere in the middle because um, there's some things that you want to always run and there's some things that you know the developers on this particular project, they know best. Um, cross repo dependencies. Uh, we support um, having changes in one 
Git repository depend on changes in another repository. And we don't particularly care where that other repository is hosted. It could be in the same Garrett. It could be in a GitHub or a GitLab or a Pagure or something else. Um, it makes no difference to Zool. So if you've got this silo of people working in a, a GitLab over on one part of the organization and a silo of people working in Garrett on the other and suddenly you actually have to make those two components, I don't know, run in the same car or something, then uh, you, could, you could actually do that. You could have a job that, uh, that pulls in both of those repos and test them together. You can, you can say that a change to the, the, the GitLab repo depends on a change to the Garrett repo and Zool will understand that, it won't bat an eye. Um, so gating, what is project gating? Why do I think it's something different than, than CI CD? Uh, the, the, the history of um, CI uh, kind of, I, I, I think it, it really goes back to Hudson, which I think is probably the first system that they called a continuous integration system, right? Uh, which incidentally is where OpenStack started running uh, its uh, CI. Uh, so we've actually evolved all the way from Hudson through Jenkins to Zool. Um, but that is, I think, post focused on the past. That is, you have merged a change uh, and it is now going to be continuously integrated um, into, you know, you're gonna do a build with that and see if it worked or not. Um, since then, we've, we've sort of moved into the present. We've, we've done pre-merge checks. You know, you, uh, it, it's now pretty common to open a GitHub pull request and uh, expect checks to run on that. And of course, the same thing in Garrett and, and all the other systems. Um, so it, you're, you're testing this change as you wrote it um, before it merges. Uh, that's kind of testing the present. I think project gating is testing the future. It's not just testing the change that you wrote, it's testing the change that you wrote as it is going to be merged. Whether that means making sure that it's uh, actually uh, rebased on the, the state of the repository if it's moved since then, that's kind of the simplest thing. But also going back to these cross repo dependencies, um, it, it, it means testing this change as it will be merged, assuming that these other changes that it depends on are merged. Or if you've got a bunch of changes in queued lined up to be merged uh, in, in sequence, making sure that, that the, the change at the end of the sequence still works with all of the ones ahead of it. So this, to me, is what makes project gating distinct from CI, CD, and it's basically how Zool works and it's hard to make it work any other way. So uh, in, in, in essence, uh, gating is when every change uh, proposed for a repository is tested before it merges, as it's going to be merged. Uh, we sort of extend this concept into, in Zool to something I call co-gating, which is uh, changes to a set of repositories uh, merge monotonically such that each change is tested with the current state of all the other related repositories before it merges. So you can't have co-gating without cross-project dependencies and, and, and that sort of thing. And then finally, what Zool does uh, in order to achieve maximum throughput is parallel co-gating. And that's where uh, if you're proving a bunch of changes, um, they're serialized into sort of a virtual queue so that every change is tested with all the changes ahead of it to satisfy the co-gating requirement while still being able to run tests for the multiple changes in that queue simultaneously. So if you're a visual person, this is what Zool's merge queue or gating pipeline or whatever you wanna call it looks like. So maybe you have some changes that have been merged already up there at the top. Um, then after that, you've got the change that you're, the, the next one that's lined up to be merged, it's currently testing. Uh, there's a change behind it, maybe it's already failed its tests. So what Zool does is actually pulls it aside uh, out of the queue temporarily because its tests are failing, so it knows it's not going to merge. But it doesn't know whether its tests are failing because that change is bad or the change ahead of it is bad. It, it could be either at this point. So it's gonna, it's gonna keep it around, but pull it out of sequence. And then uh, it'll go ahead and start testing the next change after that with the presumption that the change ahead isn't going to merge. If any of this changes at any point, what Zool does is it rearranges the queue again, restarts all the jobs as needed. So um, all of this is running in parallel. 
And uh, if things are going well, then what, what you end up doing is, is running the tests for all of the changes in parallel, and they still get merged in the correct sequence in, in a guaranteed order with the, the correct testing guaranteed. If things are going very badly, then you might end up restarting jobs a lot and moving changes in and out of the queue, and, and, and it's a bad day for everyone, but uh, your tests are failing, right? Like there's, what else can you do? So, um, so this is what Zool does to, to try to be as correct as possible uh, while still being as fast as possible. So to, to think sort of about how the speculative execution works, um, you know, you've got a complex system based on, on um, infrastructure and front ends and libraries and things like that. You might make some changes to your library dependencies, and then you might make a, a, a change to your front end that depends on those changes, and then you might make an infrastructure change that deploys the front end. And what you can do with Zool is, is express the dependencies uh, between all of those uh, projects, and uh, and Zool will make sure that they're tested together and then merged in the in the correct order. So, sort of applying that to the previous slide, maybe you've already merged your library changes, and then you've got your front end change, and then the infra change is the one that may or may not be working, right? Um, so that's that's kind of how Zool um, deals with all of this. One of my favorite things about Zool that really can change how developers work is it frees you from the sort of the tyranny of the mono repo, right? A lot of people um, say, you, you say, oh, we're using a mono repo because we can't figure out how to test our system otherwise. Uh, you know, it's just like, how do you how do you actually deal with so many different components and have them update? atomically in the correct order and stuff like that. With Zool, you have the tools to actually break up your mono repo uh, in, into other repositories. And um, basically there's, there's a bunch of different combination methods, right? So if you've, if you've broken up a system into multiple repositories and you want to make that system work together uh, as a whole, there's a couple of ways you, you can combine them again. And by the way, this is, this is Zool's original use case, right? So going back to OpenStack, why did we write Zool in the first place? It's because OpenStack is a bunch of different little repositories. Nobody wanted to talk to each other. Um, but somehow we were supposed to ship a thing called OpenStack, and it was supposed to work. So uh, we had to put them together. So, so anyway, the, the, the different combination methods that you could use. Library relationships, that's pretty straightforward, right? You, you just you express a dependency in, in, in the usual way. Say, I depend on this version of this library. Um, you can. Uh, uh, you can combine a system through network interfaces, right? So this is microservices. You, you have a bunch of container images and you deploy them all in a Kubernetes. Uh, or you can do um, submodules in, in Git um, and, and you know, effectively end up with something that looks like a mono repo but is actually composed of lots of different Git repositories. So I'm not gonna talk about library dependencies because that, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but if you are combining services together with microservices, um, Zool comes with, so Zool has sort of this standard library of jobs, right? Um, not only is it the system that runs the jobs, but since the jobs are, are described in a distributed manner in Git, we also made a library of common jobs that anybody can use. And in that library of common jobs, uh, we have a bunch of roles for preparing uh, container execution environments. So, you know, spin up Kubernetes or set up something with Docker Compose so that we can use speculatively built container images and, and do the deployment that way. Um, so there's a lot of, it's not, it's not simple, uh, as you would expect. Uh, deploying ephemeral container environments is, is, is never simple, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, tooling there to help you already um, get something like that going. Submodules. Um, Submodules are kind of scary. Um, a lot of developers, I think, rightly uh, want to avoid using them. In fact, I think a lot of developers really don't want to use submodules at all, but they're afraid of admitting that they're really complicated and nobody knows how they work. But, but honestly, like, they are, they are complicated. They're hard for people to get working. Uh, we should all admit that. Um, 
but uh, if you're going to use submodules, I think Garrett's the best system to, to do that with. Uh, and part of that is because of the submodule subscription system. Um, there is, you can of course use submodules in the, in the traditional way where you, you intentionally point at a specific commit and then update that, right? Uh, but that doesn't actually lend itself to a speculative execution environment. Um, because if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna like merge a change to your dependency and then tag that dependency and then update the main project to point at the new tag or something like that. That's, that's something that has to be executed in a bunch of uh, distinct steps, which means you can't, you can't create this sort of like dependency series that, that all gets merged and tested together. But if you're using submodule subscriptions, you can, because then if your CI system, your project gating system, is in control of when changes merge, it, merge, then it can know that once this change passes tests, that it will merge. Garrett will automatically update the subscription to the, in the submodule, and and basically all of its assumptions about the atomicity of changes merging and updating and how they relate to the overall project are correct. So, um, in other words. Combining submodule subscriptions with a project gating system that manages merging changes actually gets you a testable system where you can uh, create dependent a series of changes with dependencies that all get merged more or less at the same time. And, uh, and at every step of the way, the individual repositories are correct and the code is not broken. Um, so, how do you express these dependencies? Um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of simplest and universal way is by adding a depends on git commit footer. Um, so sort of like how you add the change ID in Garrett, um, you can add a depends on footer uh, that, that um, and then put the URL of the change that it depends on underneath it. And so this URL is, is how we implement this in a cross uh, repo or cross-source dependency way. So this depends on URL could be, it could point to a say, sorry, could point to a change in the same project. It could point to a change in a different project in the same Garrett. It could point to a chain, a pull request in GitHub or a merge request in GitLab or anything like that. Uh, this, is, this is how Zool creates those dependencies between changes and pull requests without caring how they um, where they uh, are from. So an interesting thing about the depends on footer, it is named depends on uh, because back in, I don't know, 2012 or something, uh, there was this proposal to add um, support to Garrett for cross repo dependencies. And it was going to use a commit footer called depends on. And, and so in, in Zool, we were like, we'll use the same thing. It'll be great. Um, things changed in Garrett land and that didn't exactly happen, but we stuck with the, the depends on footer. And even though it's deprecated, you can still use, as of today, you can still use the depends on uh, footer with the Garrett change ID as well. Um, we prefer the URL because that's a way of, of uh, uh, sort of, indicating that uh, it's universal for other code review systems uh, and, and makes it easy for people to understand and that sort of thing. But um, that's the history of it. That's one of those fun things in where, where Zool and, and Garrett go way back together. Um, what Garrett did end up doing though is uh, doing something similar with the submit whole topic uh, thing. And so once again, uh, Garrett said, hey, we implemented a thing. And so we have done that in Zool. And um, you can, if you have submit whole topic enabled in Garrett and you have multiple changes with the same Garrett topic, uh, Zool will see that and it will test them together. Um, because these changes are, um, are not ordered, right? Like there's no order to changes in the Garrett topic. They, if you're using a depends on footer, you can order the changes. You can say A depends on B, and that is an order. 
If you say A depends on B and then B depends on A, you've created a dependency cycle, which Zool is fine with. Um, uh, it, it handles them more or less as you'd expect them to. Uh, uh, whenever it runs jobs for the first change, uh, all the repos will include both changes, right? So both sides of the dependency see the same thing. Um, these circular dependencies can also be created automatically uh, if you use submit whole topic with Garrett. So basically, if you just upload a, a, a series, uh, a same topic series into Garrett, uh, Zool will do exactly the right thing um, to work with Garrett in merging it. It's gonna test all the changes together and uh, uh, assuming that you have Zool controlling the merging of changes, it'll tell Garrett to merge it and Garrett will merge all of those changes together. So essentially you've got uh, atomic as close to atomic merges as you can get across repositories. And again, this is only something you can do with Garrett. There are no topic dependencies in GitHub or anything else, but, but you can, it's basically two-phase commit for Git, and you can't do that with any other system. Um, uh, Zool is 99.9% Zool is .9 sure those changes are gonna merge together because Garrett is 99.9% .9 sure those changes are gonna merge together. There is actually, I, I don't know if, this, if anyone's ever seen this, there is error handling in Garrett for, uh, I thought I was gonna merge the whole topic, but something went wrong. Um, hopefully, Zool's, if, if Zool is managing your change queue, then uh, things are less likely to go wrong. Um, but theoretically, there's that possibility, and in that case, it turns out Garrett is just gonna give up, and Zool's gonna give up, and you know, at that point, Humans are gonna have to get involved, but that almost never happens. Um, so I can run through a quick example of what submit whole topic looks like uh, if, if, if you wanna maybe wrap your head around something concrete. So imagine you've got a, a client server-based calculator, right? Because that's the world we live in, client <laughs> microservice client server calculators, right? So you've got three repos, one with the server, one with the client, and then one um, uh, are, are where we're running the, the, the test of it. Um, so let's say we're using Go today because the cool kids are using Go or something. Um, uh, so here's, here's a calculator server. It's got a, you know, a REST API endpoint for adding things. Here's a calculator client. Um, it, it posts operands, right? So this is, this is a very readable program that is gonna add one and four together. It's hard-coded. Um, so, and then in the calculator test repo, uh, we've got uh, a test script, right, that builds our calculator server and runs it, and then uh, builds our calculator client and runs it uh, and checks the output, right? So um, we, we run those things. We, we, uh, and, and the output says that one plus four is, is five. Um, so George Orwell would be proud. Um, and so let's, get, let's update it. We're gonna add a multiplication endpoint, right? right? So we update our server, we add the, the multiply endpoint, uh, we update our client, we say that we're, instead of adding one to four, we're gonna multiply two by four, right? Uh, and then we upload both of those changes together uh, with the same Garrett topic. Um, so is this, yeah, that looks kind of readable. Um, so you can see we've got uh, a calculator client change, a calculator server change. Um, they both have the same Garrett topic. Neither one of these things is merged yet, right? So um, this is all just uh, still in code review. Uh, we approve our first change and uh, once uh, at this point, Zool sees that, but nothing happens yet because the second change hasn't been proved. If we approve our second change, Zool says, okay, all of the changes in this dependency cycle have been approved now, so I can enqueue both of them into the gate pipeline. So uh, even though it's a dependency cycle, Zool still kind of pretends that there's an order because it can't handle changes that aren't ordered. Um, that, that actually might be changing soon. But for the moment, it, it still, it looks like they're ordered, um, but on the back end, it's not actually gonna merge either of them unless both of them uh, pass their tests. So we start running uh, the, the test job for both of these changes in parallel. 
Um, and the, the, oh, incidentally, uh, implementation detail. On the back end, Zool will actually deduplicate this job. So if it's the same job, it's not going to run it twice. If they require different jobs, um, because you know one of the, you you need to run the linters on the on the server, and you also need to run the linters on the client, right? Uh, Zool will will run those two different jobs as well. Uh, so once that build is successful, um, we can see our our output again. Two times four is eight. Uh, so, so that looks good. And then the changes are merged simultaneously in Garrett. Um, so I told you that Zool has eight ways of interfacing with Garrett, depending on how you count them. Some things count twice. Uh, but SSH stream events is the, uh, the oldest method, of course. Uh, in, in the beginning was stream events, right? Um, and, and it's still there, and, um, and as much of, as it annoys Luca, um, some, some people still use it, uh, and, and, and it still works. So, you know, if you've got a single standalone Garrett, uh, and, and it mostly stays up and your network kind of works, then you'll be fine with that. Um, there's the Checks plugin, uh, which was implemented, oh, around 2018 or so. Um, this has the notable uh, um, attribute of being the only method that has gone from the experimental phase directly to deprecated <laughs> without stopping at production anywhere in between. It's still on it is still running on Garrett Review because uh, we've, 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 we've had no options uh, until now. But now we have some options. Um, we can now... Uh, use the whole nifty pub sub system that Luca talked about earlier uh, to connect to Kafka or Kinesis or Gcloud uh, pub sub. So, uh, and um, probably Rabbit in queue soon. Um, these, these drivers aren't too hard to write. Uh, you know, we, thankfully, you know, when we wrote it for Zool, these three already existed, so it was pretty clear that we should we should do this in a very extensible way. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to extend that to, to RabbitMQ once that's there as well. Uh, so this is how Zool gets events from the system. Um, once Zool has received an event and is deciding to do something with it, uh, we need to clone Git repos, right? So that happens either over SSH or HTTP, depending on uh, which firewall ports your network folks have blocked off. Um, but uh, whichever one of those works for you, uh, Zool can handle. Uh, and, and it doesn't really matter the event source. Um, it'll, it'll, these things are completely independent and orthogonal. Uh, once Zool has, um, uh, again, decided to do something, it needs to query Garrett for information about a change. Uh, and then when it's done with running a job, it needs to report that information back to Garrett. So um, that can either happen over SSH or HTTP. Again, in the beginning was only SSH. Um, and everything that we can do with SSH, Zool supports. But I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Garrett hasn't been adding new features to the SSH query and, and reporting uh, API endpoints. So if you want to find out what files have changed, or if you want to leave line comments on individual files or things like that, you have to use HTTP. Uh, and the experience using Zool with HTTP to Garrett is so much better that um, I, I, I tell everyone, you definitely want to use H HTTP for this. Um, and I, I have to think at some point, we're probably going to think about deprecating the SSH API because it's just, it, so much stuff is not working so much of the new things that we're adding don't work over SSH. Um, in fact, most of the things I've talked about, uh, you know. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's still there. Um, so that's uh, sort of all I have prepared about uh, to talk about how wonderful Garrett is with Zool. If you'd like to learn more about Zool, um, did I mention it's an open source project? I think I did. Um, anyway, it's an open source project that has its homepage at zool-ci.org. Um, and uh, if you'd like commercial help with Zool, um, you can learn more about what I do at acmegating.com. And I'd love to answer questions, but I actually don't know the logistics of doing. 
that. Yeah, what's their popular fear? Yeah, okay. Should I just give you the microphone? Yeah. Oh, there might be a switch on the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first question is actually from me. That is, uh, what is the status of a node pool with uh, Docker? If I want to use uh, predefined Docker images and have a, a kind of set of pools with different um, different images running in different clouds, mm -hmm. how can I do that? Even so, is that supported now? Yeah. So uh, the the approach. So there's a component of Zool that has a different name because this stuff is old and and for a while it made sense to have different things because it was actually so it's called Node Pool and its purpose was to provide nodes to Jenkins. Um, back when Zool was a system of, for controlling Jenkins. Anyway, no, that's enough history of that. So there's a separate component called Node Pool that's really part of Zool that is responsible for spinning up all of those um, cloudy things that I talked about like way at the beginning of the, of the talk, but I'll put it up here because it's a good reference. Um, I have a lot of slides, don't I? There it is. It's the one with the picture of the cloud. Oop. There we go. Okay, so the approach that we've taken with NodePool is we, we don't want to be a cloud provider. Like there are other cloud providers out there. So if there is an API for interfacing with something that spins up resources and destroys them, then we are happy to add that to NodePool. So something that looks like OpenStack or AWS or Google Cloud or whatever else, we can add that to NodePool. Um, the sort of most common interface for spinning up a container image is Kubernetes. And so we support Kubernetes. So the best way to do that that we have today uh, is, to, is to hook node pool up to Kubernetes. And then in that Kubernetes, you can, you can say, you know, make these container images available as pods and, and, and node pool will do the right thing there. So that's, that's the answer to, to how to do that today. If you have some other way that you would like to um, spin up and run Docker images and it looks like kind of a public published cloud API, um, I, I, you know, Docker Cloud or, or Mesos or something like that, right? Uh, we, 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 would, we would probably accept those as, as new drivers in node pool. Um, what we, where we kind of draw the line is, is this sort of like, oh, well, I wrote a shell script to spin up a Docker container. How do I integrate that with NodePool? And, and our answer to that is, is, is basically, it's open source. If you want to do your own private thing, you can do your own private thing. But we don't, we're not going to accept maintenance of that into the upstream thing. Um, so we, we try to hew close to something that looks like a, a, a a cloud API for managing compute resources. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? That was a really long way of just saying Kubernetes, wasn't it? Yeah. Kubernetes. <laughs> so, um, you talk about the speculative execution. Can you expand on that? Because that seems magic. Yes, it's magic. <laughs> um, yeah, let me, uh, what are we, what's a good slide to help illustrate this? This one, maybe, I don't know. Um, so so it, it really is magic, um, and it is, it goes straight to the heart of, of what Zool does, and, and it, it absolutely comes from, uh, you, you remember when the Pentium was new, right? Every, everybody remembers when the Pentium was new, right? Uh, and, and, and they had this whole thing where it's like, hey, we can execute some instructions under the assumption that this branch will, will, will execute. And if it does, hey, we already did the work. Uh, and if it doesn't, then we're no worse off than before. That's basically exactly what Zool does, right? So it's going to, uh, it's going to, if you're just dealing with one change, this doesn't really matter that much, right? Um, but uh, it does a little bit, I'll get to that. But uh, if you've got more than one change, then it matters a lot. Um, so that lets you say that, that these two changes, they have to merge in sequence and the, the one depends on the other. 
And so when Zool runs those jobs, um, it's, it's going to run the jobs for the second change under the assumption that the first change has merged. So what does that mean physically? That means literally when, when Zool runs the job for the second change, it's effectively it's gonna do a, a it's gonna merge the changes into uh, the first Git repo, and then it's gonna merge the changes into the second Git repo. Or if they're the same repo, it'll merge them on top of each other, right? So, so everything that, that is expected to happen in the future based on um, people expressing dependencies between changes, people approving them and having them go into this, this pipeline of changes that are gonna be merged, Zool builds up that future step by step and, and makes sure that, that all of the jobs that are run see all of those changes. So unlike some other systems, Zool wants to be absolutely in control of the Git repos that are checked out. Um, there's, no, there's no, like in Jenkins, you've got the Git plugin and all of the other SCM plugins and things like that. That's not how Zool works. Um, Zool, behind the scenes with no ability for you to interfere at all, checks out the Git, uh, the Git repos and uh, does the, the, the merging of the proposed changes into them and then hands over a completely checked out in the correct branch. Um, but if there's more than one branch, Zool does that too, right? So you can have a change to, to the main branch of one repo that depends on a change to a stable branch of another repo. That's fine. Zool will merge that change to the stable branch of the other repo. Um, and depending on if it's the right thing to do or not, it'll check out that repo to the stable branch, or maybe it'll check out that repo to the main branch. Um, it, it, that all very much depends on, on the particular branches that changes are on. Anyway, main point is Zool handles that. Zool will, will check out those repos, uh, merge the changes, check them out to the correct branch, then hand the, the entire set of repos over to you as the job author, and you can get started running things from there. Um, we actually go so far as to delete the remotes from the repo so that you won't be tempted to, to like do a git pull or something like that because you could try that, but the only thing that could possibly do is the wrong thing for your job. Um, so, so we intentionally make that hard. Um, I mean, of course you can work around that if you really want to, but in order to do that, you're clearly saying, I, I, I know what I'm doing, I've, I've, I've broken the glass. Uh, and I'm gonna pull the switch, right? But um, Zool, Zool's not gonna make messing up your repos easy for you. Uh, it wants to be control of it. So, um, and that all comes out of this sort of speculative execution thing. Now, I've kind of talked about how that applies to preparing Git repos for jobs. The really cool thing is that also applies to Zool's own configuration. So say you're adding some new, uh, some new code to a, a repo and you need to run a new job. Um, you can add that job in the same change where you're adding the code. Uh, and even though that change hasn't merged yet, Zool will see, oh look, somebody defined a new job and said I should run it on this repo. I will run this job on this repo even though it hasn't merged. So yes, Zool is an arbitrary code execution engine that takes untrusted input from the internet. Uh, it, it is absolutely that thing. Um, but we know that it is, and we take measures to deal with that. Uh, obviously, if you're running it in, in your, you know, your corporate environment, if, if somebody you know, proposes changes to do something that they shouldn't, um, then you've got the audit trail and you can take appropriate action, right? Um, but also, you know, we've got Zools running on, on the internet um, for Garrett and for Zool itself in OpenDev and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of protections for what can and can't be done uh, in, in, in just changes that people upload. So yes, you can run it, you can, you can define a new job and Zool will run it. Um, but what you can't do is define a new job that goes in and like deletes all the artifacts from older jobs and, and things like that. There, there is actually enough, we're not that crazy. Uh, there is enough protection in place um, that, that says, okay, well, this is an untrusted change. It's allowed to do this versus this is a trusted change. And it's allowed to do more. Uh, but for the typical use case of like, I'm a developer and I want to run a new linter on this project, piece of cake. Right? You can just add that in a change, see it run, and 
if, if, if you did it wrong, the job's gonna fail. And so you can keep uploading new patch sets until it works so that the thing that finally merges to your repo, you know that it works because it's self-testing. And all of that is true with the, the whole depends on speculative ex execution environment too. So I really hope that was the question you were asking. 